Today is the seventh and last day of this February March 1984 seven day retreat. And we will read from a book, Zen Teaching of Wang Po, translated by John Blofeld. We've heard these words many times. But the beauty of understanding is that it is never in the past. Understanding can only be now. And beyond all traces of words, The talks, which are called sermons here, were recorded by Wang Po's disciple, who was a scholar, an official, government official and scholar, with a with an enormous knowledge of Buddhist scriptures, doctrines, theories, cosmology. And he recorded the talks and also his questions and answers with Wang Po. In his own preface, his name is Pei Su. He says of Wang Po, holding in esteem only the intuitive method of the highest vehicle, which cannot be communicated in words, he taught nothing but the doctrine of the one mind, holding that there is nothing else to teach, in that both mind and substance are void, and that the chain of causation is motionless, Mind is like the sun journeying through the sky and emitting glorious light, uncontaminated by the finest particle of dust. To those who have realized the nature of reality, there is nothing old or new, and conceptions of shallowness and depth are meaningless. Those who speak of it do not attempt to explain it, establish no sects, and open no doors or windows. That which is before you is it. Begin to reason about it and you will at once fall into error. Only when you have understood this will you perceive your oneness with the original Buddha nature. The, well, let's first finish this. Therefore, his words were simple, his reasoning direct, his way of life exalted and his habits unlike the habits of other men. So is written by his disciple Pei Su. <laughs> the word Buddha is frequently used in the questions by Pei Su and in Wang Po's answers. Wang Po uses the word Buddha not referring to historical Gautama Buddha, nor to a future Buddha, but in its Sanskrit sense of the awakened mind, a truth, one mind, or no mind. The word Dharma crops up occasionally referring either to the Buddha's teaching or doctrines, concepts and practices that grew up around the Buddha's teaching after his death. 
and it also refers to truth. The Master said to me, All the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but the one mind beside which nothing exists. This mind which is without beginning is unborn and indestructible. It does not belong to the categories of things which exist or do not exist, nor can it be thought of in terms of young or old. It is neither long nor short, big nor small, for it transcends all limits, measures, names, traces, and comparisons. It is that which you see before you, begin to reason about it, and you at once fall into error. It is like the boundless void which cannot be fathomed or measured. The one mind alone is the Buddha, and there is no distinction between the Buddha and sentient beings, but that sentient beings are attached to forms, and so seek externally for Buddhahood or salvation. By their very seeking they lose it, for that is using mind to grasp mind. Even though they do their utmost for a full eon, they will not be able to attain to it. They do not know that if they put a stop to conceptual thought, and forget the anxiety, truth will appear before them. Huang Po talks a lot about putting an end to conceptual thought. One may interpret this as meaning put an end to all thoughts, but whenever he becomes specific, he talks about concepts and, and comparisons and measures of enlightened and unenlightened, ignorant and wise. There's these concepts to which we get so attached or by which we get so burdened down. At one point, Pesu asks, from all you have just said, mind is the Buddha, but it is not clear as to what sort of mind is meant by this mind which is the Buddha. And Wang Po asks, how many minds have you got? Questioner, but is the Buddha the ordinary mind or the enlightened mind? And Wang Po, where on earth do you keep your ordinary mind and your enlightened mind? The questioner says, in the teaching of the three vehicles, it is stated that there are both. Why does your reverence deny it? And Wang Po says, in the teaching of the three vehicles, it is clearly explained that the ordinary and the enlightened mind are illusions. You don't understand. All this clinging to the idea of things existing is to mistake vacuity for the truth. How can such conceptions not be illusory? Being illusory, they hide mind from you. If you would only rid yourselves of the concepts of ordinary and enlightened, you would find that there is no other Buddha than the Buddha in your own mind. You people go on misunderstanding. You hold to concepts such as ordinary and enlightened, directing your thoughts outwards where they gallop around like horses. All this amounts to beclouding your own minds. 
So I tell you, mind is the Buddha. As soon as thought or sensation arises, you fall into dualism. This incredibly real thought and sensation that I am a separate entity. Different from everybody else. Separate. Isolated. And if one searches for this I, this me, this self, what does one come upon? Wang, Ko, Wang Po continues, beginningless time and the present moment are the same. Beginningless time and the present moment are the same. When there's no thought that divides and partitions. There is no this and no that. To understand this truth is called enlightenment. Pesu asks, upon what doctrine does your reverence base these words? He based this words, these words on a doctrine of so-and-so upon what did that so-and-so base that doctrine? Where one is one going to stop believing and start looking? For oneself. Wang Po says, why seek a doctrine? As soon as you have a doctrine, you fall into a dualistic thought. The questioner says, just now you said that the beginningless past and the present are the same. What do you mean by that? And Wang Po says, it is just because of your seeking it is just because of your seeking that you make a difference between them. If you were to stop seeking, how could there be any difference between them? Or the endless future. In the future sometime I will attain maybe not in this life, but maybe in the next, or and there will be a, a gradual ascension towards spiritual refinement in the future. Which is what? You see right now, it's thought, it's thinking, or else believing what somebody says. at which inquiry stops. One's own inquiry stops the moment one starts believing. It's easy, then one doesn't have to inquire. Pesu says, if they are not different, why did you employ separate terms for them? And Wang Po said, if you hadn't mentioned ordinary and enlightened, who would have bothered to say such things? Just as those categories have no real existence, so mind is not really mind. And as both mind and those categories are really illusions, wherever can you hope to find anything? And 
the questioner continues, illusion can hide from us our own mind, but up to now you have not taught us how to get rid of illusion. And the answer, the arising and elimination of illusion are both illusory. Illusion is not something rooted in reality. It exists because of your dualistic thinking. You will only cease to indulge in opposed concepts such as ordinary and enlightened. Illusion will cease of itself. And then if you still want to destroy it, wherever it may be, you will find that there is not a hair breadth left on, of anything on which to lay hold. This is the meaning of, I will let go with both hands, for then I shall certainly discover the Buddha in my own mind. What is this, letting go with both hands and feet? And what is this that one is clutching, grasping for? Trying to stand on. Mostly thoughts and memories and images, if you look carefully yourself. Which arouse both hope, inspiration and fear. Fear of losing, fear of dying, fear of not having, of not being. Not being as what? <coughs> Since we just read some selections from <coughs> the autobiography of the sixth patriarch. Let's read this one here, where reference is made to it. The questioner says, the sixth patriot, patriarch was illiterate. How is it that he was handed the robe which, was elevate, which elevated him to that office? The elder Shen Su occupied a position above 500 others, and as a teaching monk, he was able to expound 32 volumes of sutras. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he not receive the robe? And Guang Po says, because he still indulged in conceptual thought, in a dharma of activity, a teaching. To him, quote, as you practice, so you shall attain, unquote, was a reality. So the fifth patriarch made the transmission to Wei Nang. At the very moment, the latter attained a tacit understanding, a tacit understanding. Tacit meaning, I believe, quiet, doesn't it? and received in silence the profoundest thoughts of the Tathagata. Tathagata, another word for Buddha, meaning translated, he who is thus, thus come.
That's why the Dharma was transmitted to him, whatever that Dharma is. You do not see that the fundamental doctrine of the Dharma is that there are no Dharmas. you do not believe this, you must explain the following story. The elder Wei Ming climbed to the summit of the mountain to visit the sixth patriarch. The latter asked him why he had come. Was it for the robe or for the Dharma? The elder Wei Ming answered that he had not come for the robe, but only for the Dharma. Whereupon the sixth patriarch said, Perhaps you will concentrate your thoughts for a moment and not think in terms of good and evil, or avoid thinking in terms of good and evil. Ming did as he was told, and the sixth patriarch continued, While you are not thinking of good and not thinking of evil, just at this very moment, return to what you were before your father and mother were born. Even as the words were spoken, Ming arrived at a sudden tacit understanding. Accordingly, he bowed to the ground and said, I am like a man drinking water who knows in himself how cool it is. I've lived with the fifth patriarch and his disciples for 30 years, but it's only today that I'm able to banish the mistakes in my former way of thinking. The sixth patriarch replied, just so. Now at last you understand. Questioner, what is the Buddha? Answer, mind is the Buddha, while the cessation of conceptual thought is the way. Once you stop arousing concepts and thinking in terms of existence and non-existence, thinking in terms of my not being, this is something which arouses great fear in some people, this almost obsessive thought of not being. Or, just as one questions into not knowing, there it crops up. I may not be, I may discontinue to exist. There may be no me. What is this me? that arouses this fear of not being me. Once you stop arousing concepts and thinking in terms of existence and non-existence, other and self, active and passive, and such like, you will find that your mind is intrinsically the Buddha, that the Buddha is intrinsically mind, and that mind resembles a void, which doesn't mean a vacuum, that's a thought, a concept. Or oh, in physics, if you pump out the air out of a glass tube, there you have a void. No air is what it means. When those ideas, those concepts are there, one may think, I'm going to choke, I won't have any air. <laughs> yeah. We don't realize to what extent we're affected by what we know, what pressure it exerts upon the whole body-mind. If it is not examined, looked into, and seen for what it is, mostly ideas.
or past experiences which have become a memory. He said here that the mind resembles a void, that state in which nothing is grasped, nothing is run away from, escaped from, avoided or attached to, but seen for what it is, without a name. The label is not what something is, even though we confuse that. We don't realize we confuse it. Or the name and the label hides what something really is. That's why we say so much in eating, picking up something. Shaker with sesame salt. If you think this is a shaker with sesame salt, you don't see it. You just want that salt. But what is it? If you look at it, it's incredible. Ever looked at sesame salt? Without the word? Not knowing it? So Wang Po said that mind resembles a void, a void of no preconceptions. Seek for naught beside this, else your search must end in sorrow. For a while it may bring bliss and self-satisfaction, gratification, but when that goes and is over, then there's the sorrow of loss, disappointment. Wondering what one has done wrong and feeling bad about one's wrongdoing, regretting it. And all that comes from all these labels one attaches to oneself, good or bad. Wang Po continues, though you perform the six parameters, which are pious practices which are supposed to help one along on the way, to gaining enlightenment. In these six parameters, in the footnote it says, are charity, morality, patience under affliction, zealous application, right control of the mind, and the application of highest wisdom. How can one practice that? Either wisdom is there, comes out of the clarity of seeing, or it's not there. What one applies is something studied or remembered or known. And that may not have anything to do with the present situation as it is. It has to be seen. Without referring to knowledge for how one should act. Knowledge of wisdom. Wisdom is no knowledge. It's inseparable from the, the clarity of seeing, of seeing wholly.
though you perform the six parameters for as many eons as there are grains of sands in the river Ganges, adding also all the other sorts of activities for gaining enlightenment, you will still fall short of the goal. Only come to know the nature of your own mind, in which there is no self and no other. And you will in fact be a Buddha and can leave that out. What does it matter what one is called? It can already be a little seed for pride. Now I'm a Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and it does happen. None of us is immune. Here he comes back again, or maybe it's another questioner. If mind and the Buddha are intrinsically one, should we continue to practice the six parameters and the other orthodox means of gaining enlightenment? Which are laid down in, in scriptures and taught in stages and one can read up on it oneself. And Wang Po says, enlightenment springs from mind regardless of your practice of the six parameters and the rest. All such practices are merely expedients for handling concrete matters when dealing with the problems of daily life. Even enlightenment, capitalized, the absolute capitalized reality, sudden attainment, dharmakaya, and all the others down to the ten stages of progress, the four rewards, rewards of virtuous and wise living, and the state of holiness and wisdom, these are all capitalized, these must all be Buddhist concepts of practice. They are, every one of them, mere concepts for helping us through samsara, meaning our daily living, I don't know what he means by helping us through it. They have nothing to do with the real mind, the real Buddha mind. The ideal way of attainment is to cultivate that mind. Only avoid conceptual thoughts, of the kinds he's just enumerated, which lead to becoming and to cessation, to the afflictions of the sentient world and all the rest, then you will have no need of methods of enlightenment and such like. He says, only avoid conceptual thoughts which lead to becoming and cessation. Becoming, I want to become that, I want to make that progress. Or cessation is trying to suppress, cut off, or repress all mental activity, physical desire, submitting to austerities, trying in that way to attain whatever. He says, this only leads to the afflictions of the sentient world and all the rest. You have no need for methods of enlightenment and such like. Please let me say at this moment that Wang Po here is not read for me as a resort to some higher authority. Wang Po is no authority. What he says, he says. And we listen. One has to test it for oneself.
not saying this to put a point across. What is it pointing at? Will one look or does one follow? Not just in these matters, but in all the matters of one's daily life. Follow the advice and counseling of others or search and look and question for oneself. Which is much harder. It's arduous. But with this one can come upon what is true what is so, what is actually really so. And, and that, free oneself of it. Seeing the truth is the only thing that frees. No one else can free one. Here at one point he says, when we talk of the knowledge I may gain, the learning I may achieve, my intuitive understanding, my deliverance from rebirth, my moral way of living, my is always in quotation marks, our successes make these concepts seem pleasant to us, but our failures may them appear, make them appear deplorable. What is the use of all that? I advise you to remain uniformly quiescent and above all such activity. Do not deceive yourselves with conceptual thinking, which means one must be able to see conceptual thinking as it takes place, and that it is conceptual thinking. Which is no mean task to see that. And yet it can be seen, as people know for themselves. One can see the difference between a thought and seeing what is actually so. Or one can see that a thought is a thought, a concept is a concept. It's not the real thing. Do not deceive yourselves with conceptual thinking. Do not look anywhere for the truth. For all that is needed is to refrain from allowing concepts to arise. Or, let us add, once they have arisen from dominating one, one's body-mind, as they do if they go unseen. At one point of having discussed something or other, Wang Po says, discuss it as you may. How can you even hope to approach the truth through words? So full understanding can come to you only through an inexpressible mystery. We 
which means no cause to understanding, no cause for awakening. Because it is not of cause. To approach to it is called the gateway of the stillness beyond all activity. Which doesn't mean to sit still now for the rest of one's life. No. Can there be stillness in activity? That's a tremendous question. Which if one asks that and, and really wants to find out whether this is possible, that, that there can be stillness in activity. If that really ignites one to find that out, then one will watch, and to watch there has to be stillness. Don't take the word watch too literally. It is, it is an, inner, an inner listening, an inner attending. an inner wondering. Which creates space and quiet around itself. Wang Po continues, if you wish to understand, then know that a sudden comprehension comes when the mind is purged of all the clutter of conceptual and discriminatory thought activity. Those who seek the truth by means of intellect and learning only get further and further away from it. As he's speaking often to an audience of scholars, of people at that time who really sincerely believed that by studying Buddhist doctrine, sutras and so forth, that was a step on the way, maybe a considerable step, and it's not only at that time that it was believed. It's believed now, and it's done. To study, memorize, recite, repeat. Not till your thoughts cease all their branching about here and there, not till you abandon all thoughts of seeking for something, not till your mind is motionless will you be on the right road. Which does not mean absence of thoughts. This, this thought alone could fill one with total despair. It is this stillness among, in the midst of activity we talk, talked about, which comes out of wondering, listening, in the midst of the hubbub of our daily life. And also to examine whether all the hubbub really has to take place. A lot of it can be cut out when a lot of stuff is, is not necessary. When it's overactive, so many commitments, so many activities, so many things one has joined and participates in are, are not necessary. So little is needed. If there's living and listening and attending 
in depth from moment to moment. He says at another place, a perception sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one. A perception sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one, leads to a deeply mysterious wordless understanding. And by this understanding, you will awake to the truth of Zen. Of truth, one doesn't have to say of Zen makes it sound as though it was something separate. When you happen upon someone who has no understanding, you must claim to know nothing. He may be delighted by his discovery of some way to enlightenment, yet if you allow yourselves to be persuaded by him, you will experience no delight at all, but suffer both sorrow and disappointment. Well, that's for each to find out. What have such thoughts as this to do with the study of Zen? Even if, you do not, even if you do obtain from him some trifling method, it will only be a thought-constructed thing having nothing to do with Zen. Zen here not standing for a, a method, a school, a sect, but the fullness, the wholeness of understanding from moment to moment. Then he continues later on, true nature is something never lost to you even in moments of delusion, nor is it gained at the moment of enlightenment. In it is neither delusion nor right understanding. It fills the void everywhere and is intrinsically of the substance of the one mind. It is fundamentally without spatial dimensions, delusions or right understanding. It depends on nothing and is attached to nothing. It is all pervading, spotless beauty. It is the self existent and uncreated absolute. Then, how can it even be a matter for discussion that the real Buddha has no mouth and preaches no teaching, that the real hearing requires no ears? For who could hear it? Ah, it is a jewel beyond all price.
We will stop here for today.